Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining the Smart Cities Research Track. Uh, I'm Faru Garamani, Associate Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Sponsored Programs at NJ Edge. Um, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, moderating this um, session. Um, the format will be, uh, we will have um, present individual presentations. And after each presentation, we will have a few minutes of Q&A and then move on to uh, the next presentation. Um, the presenters, um, Howdy Jang, um, will um, discuss a big data enabled AI powered space weather analytics with community driven cyber infrastructure. Dylan Perry will um, present federated energy demand prediction design for electric vehicle charging station networks. Uh, Ning Wang will present load management and schedule co cooperation between small building and e-buses. Uh, Michael Bell uh, will present on the role of inclusivity in the evolution of law and policy to accommodate smart, sustainable cities. And uh, Deep Patel will present on evaluating intersection safety using surrogate safety measure and non-compliance behaviors. Thank you. And um, I invite um, Howdy Jang to join us. Baru, it looks like Howdy um, is having issues. He was in, but then he left. Uh, let me. Oh, okay. Let me see so we'll start that. with Dylan Perry. Hello. Hi, Dylan. If you'd like to project your slides. Sure. So. And um, well, let me introduce Dylan appropriately. Dylan is a um, BS candidate at Rowan University. Okay, are my slides visible? Yes. Okay, all right. So what I've been working on is um, federated energy demand uh, prediction design for electric vehicle charging station networks. Um, I've been working with two professors uh, as an uh, undergraduate research assistant. And um, yeah, so I'll just go through some background, then um, kind of the objectives, um, the methods, results, conclusions, future prospects for um, what I've been working on, all of that. Um, so the background, uh, Internet of Things devices have been growing in popularity, um, just increasing. Uh, by 2025, they will, uh, Statista predicts uh, 38.6 million Internet of Things devices will be um, worldwide. This leads to a significant increase in devices that allow us to uh, kind of collect and communicate data at the same time. And obviously we want to utilize um, all the potential for these IoT devices, kind of um, get out all the computing power and communication power uh, we can out of them. Uh, one example of these devices is electric vehicle charging stations. Um, they're connected on a network. Um, they have decent computing power. They're able to record um, all the data that goes through them. And they are growing as well, installed at a rate to keep up with the production of uh, the electric vehicles. But um, for these charging stations, supplying the energy poses um, quite a problem, especially as um, the need for them continues to grow. Uh, providing energy to vehicles on demand at the charging stations um, costs more than um, supplying the data, supplying the energy ahead of time. And then when the car comes to charge, they can access it. So the problem is, how do we um, supply each charging station with the correct amount of energy needed without um, uh, giving an excess, uh, just to minimize costs and make the growing of these charging stations easier. So 
the the proposed method is to have the charging stations um, use machine learning model aggregation methods um, to kind of communicate with each other uh, along usage patterns and um, just popularity and energy demands uh, in order to predict future usage. Um, predicting the future energy usage of um, the stations would allow energy to be purchased ahead of time without much excess um, being purchased to uh, minimize the cost. Basically finding the sweet, stop, sweet spot between purchasing energy ahead of time without too much versus um, the cost of purchasing it on demand when the cars reach the stations. Um, this would reduce the cost to operate charging stations and make them more appealing to expand and make owning an electric vehicle more accessible. Um, so to test these uh, machine learning models and aggregation methods, um, there is a data set located in Dundee, uh, United Kingdom, uh, 57, 57 charging stations spread throughout the city. Uh, these stations have uh, varying popularity. They're in dense locations. They're in um, sparse locations. Um, each has um, various number of records ranging from very few, less than uh, 50 to over 7,000. So um, the amount of use each station gets is what makes this a problem. The, the less transactions or the less records a charging station has, the harder it is to predict. Um, so um, the proposed method would kind of group uh, stations with less um, records, with stations with more records that are easier to predict, um, grouping them uh, with similar trends so that they are uh, easier to predict on. Um, so the method for kind of counteracting insufficient records for each charging station um, is data set clustering. So each um, record from the charging stations contains a list of all the transactions, all the cars that have um, charged there, how long they charged for, how much energy they took up. And so all of this data gets um, inputted into a dynamic time warping uh, k-means clustering method, which um, takes a look at the trends of each charging station's um, records over time and kind of um, matches each um, data set with uh, other like stations that have the same kind of uh, trend in their data to make it, uh, to make data sets with um, a lot of records that can be easily predicted on. And then the other method to use um, for these models is the federal uh, federated averaging method, which um, trains local models to um, train on their data, then uh, communicate these weights to a higher aggregated model that is able to predict on all stations um, and all local models. So yeah. with this method, only the model weights need to be transferred, which cuts down on communication overhead. And the federated averaging um, model method is a proven method of training with low rounds of communication. So the communication overhead is further cut with only a couple rounds needed to um, get the aggregated model uh, to optimal accuracy. And so um, we also compare the performance increase obtained from different implementation implementations of the federated averaging method, ranging from um, just one global model to multiple cluster models. Um, on the different uh, charging stations. And so what happens is each ch charging station um, gets clustered into uh, a data set group of uh, stations that have similar trends. Um, they go into a, um, a cluster model that gets trained on all of the charging station data sets that it represents. And then these uh, cluster models will get aggregated into a global model that will be able to predict um, the load for each cluster. And so early results show that um, on the left, these uh, charging station data sets um, in time series data 
Um, early results show that clustering methods do um, kind of align like charging stations with themselves, uh, with others. Um, so you can see here that there's multiple stations that kind of have the same trend in their data. So combining these um, records will allow for a larger data set that the machine learning model can train on and thus um, have more accurate predictions. Um, on the right, you see the prediction error for each of the different federated averaging methods. Um, just training locally, each charging station, um, you can see the prediction is not as well, is not as um, good as the aggregated global model, which all stations are trained, then their weights um, use the federated averaging method to combine into one global model to predict. And then going further along this, um, using the clustering methods, uh, um, the cluster models will use federated averaging to a global model, um, which would further reduce the error, increase in the accuracy. Um, so conclusions, we propose the ability to predict the future energy demand by having charging stations communicate the usage data. Um, the machine learning approach would preserve usage anonymity by only communicating weights and keeping all record transactions um, local to the charging station. Um, as Internet of Things devices, the charging stations can utilize their individual low power computing to provide the bulk of the work, while global models are only used to um, aggregate the data and then um, share it back to the local devices. Um, and then these proven methods of pre-processing and model aggregation um, are shown to increase the accuracy, um, allowing the energy demand of these charging stations to be predicted and then handled ahead of time rather than on demand. And then future considerations. Um, as Internet of Things device networks grow, um, minimizing the communication overhead is um, becomes more important. So efficient transferring of data would allow for even less computer power and bandwidth to be needed. Um, these networks would suffer from less strain and um, each station would need less computing power, making it easier or cheaper to operate. Um, and then continuous clustering. So usage, of, usage patterns of stations may change over time. Um, stations may get more popular or less popular resulting in um, them falling out of certain clusters into um, other station clusters with um, uh, trends similar to the new trends that the stations are showing. And so these are just um, problems that should be, uh, are being considered uh, with this work. Well, thank you, Dylan. Um, I have a question. This was very impressive work that you're involved in. Um, sure. As a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science uh, candidate with a minor in mathematics, if you could provide us with uh, how did you get involved with research at the undergraduate level and uh, specifically focusing on distributed machine learning techniques? So um, I got involved through a couple of my professors that I had for undergraduate uh, programming classes. So um, my one professor, uh, Dr. Ho, um, uh, he gives a presentation at the um, kind of the end of his uh, semester class and where he kind of goes over um, what kind of research he's, in, he's um, involved in. And if anybody is interested in any of that, they can approach him and kind of see if there's a spot for them where they can kind of help out and maybe get involved in research at an earlier stage, um, making it easier to kind of progress into a more academic field. Um, so um, Dr. Ho did a presentation on all of this stuff and I thought it was really neat. Um, and then a spot opened up for his on his um, in his schedule for an extra research assistant. So um, he knew I was interested. So he approached me um, 
and asked if I would like to be a part of this. Um, he knew I wasn't too familiar with uh, machine learning and all of that, but um, he kind of helped me through everything. Dr. Wang as well. They both kind of helped me, um, guided me through kind of uh, learning the ins and outs of kind of machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of that. And um, kind of just uh, uh, gave me what I needed to kind of um, help out in their research. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and what are your plans after graduation? So my plans after graduation, um, I'm currently pursuing a, bach a bachelor's of science in computer science, but um, uh, if I, um, I think my plans have kind of changed uh, since then after being involved with this um, kind of undergraduate research where I think I kind of want to pursue a more academic career. So I'll probably pursue my master's before doing anything else. Well, that's great. Well, best of luck to you and thank you so much. Thank you. For participating. If you could unshare the screen and we invite, um, Howdy Jang, um, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Computer Science at Ying Wu College of Computing at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Hi everyone, thank you. I'm sorry for being late here. I got, was in trouble with the links. So I go to a wrong room. That's okay. So let me share my screen. Wait, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, I am Howdy. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the uh, Department of Computer Science at NGIT. So today I'm going to present our work uh, on the topic of big data enabled AI powered space weather research uh, <clears throat> with a community driven cyber infrastructure. So first of all, uh, what is space weather? So space, it is a term that used to uh, describe the changing environment condition in the solar system caused by the uh, solar eruptions on the sun's surface. And this is important because those events will have adverse effects on our critical technology infrastructure, such as the satellite and the power system and the communication networks on the earth so in, all, in able to analyze the space weather, uh, we design a web-based uh, cyber infrastructure uh, named SoloDB. It contains several databases and some machine learning tools and some other surveys to help space weather research. So today we are, I'm going to focus on two parts. The first part, I will discuss some, some of the machine learning tools we developed. In the second part, uh, we will show one of the database available on the website. So let's move to our first part. Uh, this is the, our first tool, deep learning tool, and it's used for uh, stock inversion. So basically we design a deep learning model that to infer the vector magnetic field from the stock profile obtained, obtained from the instrument such as uh, SDO, HMR, and the GIS, uh, BBSO GIS, G G GST. So here, uh, this work has been published in a paper, APJ paper 2020. And this is one of the results from this work. So from left side, we can see that this is an uh, image called the line on side magnetogram from SDO HMI processed by a traditional physics based uh, method called ME method. And the right side image here is from GS, GST Naris, and uh, the image was processed by our deep learning model. We can see here, uh, the result on the right side is much more cleaner, mu much smoother and cleaner. And so this is very good, uh, very, very useful for, for the uh, for solar physics to do the research. And one important that thing is that our deep learning model is much faster than the ME method it is six times faster. So basically we can use our tool for real time inversion. And the second tool we want to present here is for magnetic checking and event detection. Uh, this work is also have been published. So why, first of all, why we need to do the uh, ma magnetic checking? 
because by doing that, we can derive some statical parameters of the local and the global solo dynamical, so which allows us to analyze the some solo activity such as solo flares. And the one important event uh, we detect in the paper is called this flux element emergency, which is usually associated with solar flare and CME and CMEs. Here we show one example. Uh, and for the another event we detect called the flux element appearance. So we have two images here the, at the left side, uh, at this area pointed by the red arrow. Uh, we can see that there is no flex element here. And on the right side image, we can see that we detect a positive, the white, uh, the white, uh, the white patch on the image is called a positive uh, magnetic feature. So our tool is able to detect it and mark it uh, with blue boundaries. So this is useful uh, because we can uh, we can associate with the solar flare, which is essentially may, may affect our Earth. So the next tool we develop is called fiber tracing. So before talking about uh, uh, that, let's see what is, is fiber. So those these two uh, images in panel A and D are the full disk HF images from NSO and KSO. And you may see some uh, dark black Dots on the uh, Fudix image is not very clear. So we, we take a region out, enlarge it. You can see that fiber are those dark elongated features on the solo disk. And our tool is be able to pre predict those fiber peach features and then mark them as red curves on the HF image. So why fiber chasing? Because um, fiber chasing theor theoretically, Fiber, uh, fiber can be fiber orientation can be used to chase magnetic field line direction, and which itself is not visible. So by chasing that, we can kind of model the direction of the uh, solar, solar magnetic field. That is very important to the solar physicists. And the third, uh, the fourth uh, tool we developer is for solar man, uh, ima solar image generation. So let's first of all take a look at this example here. The top two panel are the image directly from the observation. Uh, those are the SDOHMI image. This image are called the BX and the BY. The, those are uh, BX, BY magnetic field component. So uh, the bottom panel shows the, uh, the AI generator BX, BY by our tools. So you may ask why we need to do this uh, since we already can get those BXBY from the instrument directly, right? But there is an issue here because right now we are in solo cycle 24. And in this solo cycle, our advanced instrument is able to get the BXBY from the observation directly. But before that, for example, for solo cycle 23, uh, those old uh, uh, instrument does not, uh, the data from those instruments does not have BXBY available. So we want to utilize all the historical data so that we can analyze the solo flare activity, activities in multi-cycle solos, uh, multi-solo cycles. That is the purpose of this project. And the last tool we developed is for solo flare and CME forecasting, which is directed to our, uh, to, uh, to directed, uh, Direct, uh, direct to our Earth because we, as we mentioned before, the CME may cause the geomatic storm on the Earth, which may shut down the satellite and the communication network. So this work has, uh, partial of this work have been published in two paper and we are keep going, uh, keep doing that. So here we want to use our computer vision and the deep learning techniques to predict and check the filament eruption and the CMEs because 95% uh, filament, uh, filament eruption is uh, associated with fl solar flares and half of them may, leading to, uh, may lead to a uh, CME eruption. So this is an image that's uh, taken from AIA eruption category. We can see here, right here, 
these are called uh, filament eruption. And uh, if you can see here, those, those are, we can see some particles energies eject from this part. So this is called CME. So <clears throat> now let's go to our next part. Uh, next part, we build the, we want to introduce the cyber infrastructure we built for the space weather research. This is our home page, and we can see you can see here we have a database menu here. Down uh, in this menu, we have basically we have three uh, different kind of database. One is uh, the first one is we're gonna to talk next is called the Flare database, and the other two one is called the global global HR network. And the last one is the database from BBSO, a Big Bell Solar Observatory. And the tool manual here provided the tool we de developed for the space weather research. So, next, so next, let's move to uh, one of the, our database we developed. It's called the Flare database. So basically this database contains two parts. The first part is contains the, all the significant flares, uh, which is, uh, the flare class larger than M5 uh, in the solar cycle 24. And we also provide another group called insignificant flares as a control group for research purpose. After clicking the sub submit query button here, we, you can see all the event at least as a table down there. And if you could click a particular event, we can you can go to the this page, and uh, this page shows that the image at right now the image are all come from SDO, and we provide five different kind of images options for you to choose, and we also provide the cadence is twelve cadence and two second, um, <clears throat> and we provide two buttons here. So one is for download all the feed file. If you click it, you can. Uh, download all the data related to this solar flare event. And maybe before that, uh, you want to see a quick movie of that, what the flare looks like, because uh, in case you, are, you, can, you can choose the one you want to study. So here we show an uh, example flare from AR111 for tonight. Uh, this movie shows the precursor and aftermath of a significant, significant flare in our solar uh, database. Those, these are called the flares here. Those are called the flares. And uh, this flare is a large flare, so it caused the uh, CME eruption, uh, which eventually may, may reach Earth and uh, shut down the satellite. So to conclude our work, uh, we develop a, a, a a cyber infrastructure uh, that contains some database and some machine uh, learning tools for community, uh, solo community research and uh, use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, it, it seems you've, you've developed some really, really um, amazing tools. Um, are the tools available to the general community? Yes, it is a web service. So by enter, enter the web link, uh, the link uh, nature.ngit.edu slash solodb, you can see all the database and all the uh, tool we developed is already on the website. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And, and the data, database, database is also available? Yes, it's available for public use. That's the purpose we designed this uh, database. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Any questions from the audience? Well, um, the, if you could share the link in the chat so that um, those who are interested can, um, can follow up, that would be great. Thank you so much, Audi. Thank you, thank you very much. I will provide the link later, thank, thank you. you. And now um, we'd like to invite Ning Wang, who is assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Rowan University to um, provide his pre presentation. Okay, so let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? 
Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks for your introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ning Wang, and I'm currently an assistant professor at Taiwan University. And uh, currently, I'm doing uh, some uh, research regarding uh, resource management and uh, system optimization for IoT system. Uh, today, today, I'm so happy that I can, uh, I can be here and uh, present my uh, collaborative work uh, with uh, Professor Jie Li at the ECE department. And uh, actually, we are looking for uh, collaborations for this uh, project. So the title of my presentation today is uh, Electric Load Management with Schedule Cooperation Between Smart uh, Buildings and uh, E-Buses. Uh, first, uh, here, let me give you some uh, motivation why we want to conduct this research. Uh, here, uh, uh, currently, we are in a big uh, transition uh, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from traditional uh, bus to uh, electric bus. This is called the transportation electrification. The reason why we want to do this is that uh, currently, the transport sector is responsible for almost a quarter of uh, worldwide uh, total uh, carbon uh, dioxide uh, emissions. And also based on some prediction, uh, the greenhouse uh, gas emission will increase, will further increase about uh, 50% uh, if no new policy are introduced. So that's a big background. And the uh, uh, transportation uh, electrification, electrification is a promising technology that uh, where we can use uh, electric vehicles uh, here, such as uh, electric uh, buses, to reduce the greenhouse uh, gas emission. Okay, so that's a that's a good set for this uh, transportation electrification. Uh, however, uh, this uh, 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 this uh, transportation electrification will have a big impact on our existing uh, power infra infrastructures. So here, I just want to share with you some. Uh, 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 some uh, data. So for, uh, for example, uh, currently in order to support these uh, EVs, we need to build uh, uh, charging stations. So uh, here, uh, for example, here currently for a single charger, uh, for a single Tesla V3 supercharger, uh, that charger will consume a, a power rate up to two, uh, 250 kilowatt. That's a, that's a big amount, that's a big amount. Not to mention that for one, uh, charging stations, there are multiple char chargers like this. Uh, that will have a big impact on our existing power uh, infrastructure. Also, uh, people uh, here, uh, uh, the author here did some uh, preliminary uh, study and they tried to simulate if we uh, simulate, if we uh, replace our current uh, buses with uh, electrical buses, uh, what will happen to our, uh, uh, to our uh, to our pol uh, power consumption, community power consumption, and here's some result. Uh, here's something I want to highlight is that uh, uh, if we con uh, if 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 uh, fifty percent of uh, buses are changed to uh, EVs, our uh, <coughs> our peak load uh, consumption will almost double. That will uh, have a very big impact our. Um, very big uh, uh, pressure to our uh, power infrastructure, and uh, the 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 utility and the utility company and the power company they have their own solution to address such a, such a, such a pressure. So they try to charge you more during those uh, peak uh, during that uh, peak hours, so that uh, you don't want to really use uh, use uh, electricity at that at that period of time. Uh, so. Uh, so that's uh, and this uh, this uh, actually uh, this uh, peak demand charge is very uh, is very expensive is very expensive. If you take a look of your electricity bill, uh, you will find that uh, a major part of your bill is due to this uh, peak demand charge. Okay. Uh, then definitely we want to uh, we don't want to pay a lot of money to our uh, to utility company. Uh, so here's our, uh, there's something that we can do today. So some, uh, today our building and our home are very smart now, and we have this uh, IoT uh, devices. We have this IoT devices. Uh, this IoT devices uh, can collect data and do some data analysis. And also our, uh, uh, they can control our appliance uh, to, to, uh, to control their energy usage. 
Um, so it's possible that we can flat the peak load uh, by, uh, by a good electricity load management approach. So a, a good thing for this uh, is uh, twofold. Uh, first, uh, we can, uh, the first we can reduce our energy costs. That's we can, which we want to pay less money to those uh, electricity company. But uh, the second, the more important thing here is that uh, actually uh, through this uh, electric load management, we can greatly reduce uh, the pressure of our existing power infrastructure. That's also very important. So that's why we want to conduct this uh, electric load management uh, optimization. Uh, so here's our long-term goal. Uh, in the long term, uh, we hope we can uh, apply and uh, install this uh, electric load management uh, at our campus uh, to see uh, how much uh, how much uh, uh, load that we can reduce and how much uh, co uh, electricity cost that that we can reduce by using some uh, <coughs> by uh, uh, by using this uh, smart electric load management approach. So here's a, a proposed plan that we are currently uh, working on. So here, I just want to demo our idea. So here, as you can see here, uh, uh, this is a total energy uh, uh, consumption of uh, Rwan University at a different time slot. And uh, uh, this is an uh, energy consumption of each building or each site uh, during different uh, slots. So uh, if this, uh, Buildings and uh, and also the charging stations that we plan to build uh, in the near future, if the uh, if their load are not uh, uh, managed uh, managed properly, at a certain time uh, our campus will have a very large peak load, so our so we need to we need to pay a lot of money, and also we, we may have to update upgrade our power infrastructure that will be very uh, costly. We don't want to really do that. So on the other hand, uh, what we can do here is that uh, we can uh, uh, propose, we can apply some uh, smart load management control, so that uh, they can uh, all these sites can use energy in a coordinated way. Uh, through that, uh, through this uh, uh, software uh, management, uh, we can control limit our energy consumption as a, into a certain level, into a certain level. That's uh, that's our plan. So, uh, okay, so in this page, I want to uh, elaborate a little bit more about our plan. So, so here we will try to minimize the peak load with scheduled operation between charging, uh, EV charging stations and the smart buildings. The reason why we want to minimize peak load uh, is that uh, if we have a larger peak load, we will have a very large uh, peak load charge. That's, uh, that's very expensive. Uh, so uh, through this uh, uh, schedule uh, uh, optimization, we would like to consider uh, building uh, res uh, residence uh, satisfactions, uh, uh, schedule flexibility, operation uh, flexibility, and uh, utilization efficiency, and so on. Okay. Uh, so here uh, I would like to talk about what kind of op load, man load management that we can do here. Uh, first, we can address our load. We can adjust the load. Say uh, previously, uh, you want to consume a uh, uh, five or uh, watts, uh, five, uh, five watts per hour, but we can say, okay, at this point, you you probably want to reduce it to three. And also, uh, uh, some of our uh, uh, energy consumption is kind of flexible. Say, uh, for example, we want to charge our car, but we don't really need to charge it at this point. We can delay it like one hour, and it have no impact at all. But uh, that uh, makes uh, our energy, our campus peak load uh, uh, flatter. It's, uh, it's uh, very important. So uh, that's another operation that we can do. We can conduct operation scheduling shifting. So uh, the con contribution of our work is that uh, previously, uh, for previous work, they only consider the load management within smart buildings or within this EV charging station. Uh, that's that's uh, that's not correct. Actually, uh, we 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 care more about the peak load, and uh, in this, and we really need to jointly consider this uh, uh, energy demand of this uh, charging station and the smart building together. Okay. So uh, here's the method that we propose at this point. Uh, so uh, we try to use the deep reinforced learning method to to uh, to uh, to to figure out the optimal energy uh, 
uh, utilization uh, operation uh, schedule. Okay, and the deep learning, uh, reinforced learning method has uh, uh, has been proved to be very efficient in many tasks, such as play games and uh, try to find the the good uh, pro uh, proteins and also play uh, and uh, play goals like this. Uh, so due to the time reason, I, I will not uh, talk about this in detail, but just a very high level idea here. So here we can, uh, so we can uh, model the whole uh, power, uh, our power system into a, into a, uh, into an environment uh, in, for different uh, actions, uh, for different action, uh, for different operations, uh, and uh, different uh, energy consumption operations, just like the actions here in the deep reinforcement learning. For different operations, we can provide uh, uh, we can provide some reward and penalty. If we believe that this action, this uh, energy operation is very good, we try to provide this, some reward uh, to tell the uh, deep rings for uh, uh, the deep rings learning agent saying, "Okay, this is good. Uh, so you may want to try this uh, this kind of operations more." Also, if we feel like uh, some operation will, if for for op uh, if for the agent. Uh, uh, did some operation which increased the peak load will uh, will also give some feedback. So here is like the penalty. Uh, tell the agent saying that okay, so this is uh, not a good option. You may you may try to avoid this in the future. Okay. <clears throat> so we did some uh, preliminary studies. So here we just uh, have uh, we just uh, conduct uh, this just uh, to demo our idea. So here we have uh, two set and we have the energy cons consumption of each set. And here, this is a total energy consumption. So if there's uh, no collaboration at all, so you can see here, the total energy consumption is like 1.2. Uh, then we further apply this uh, deep reinforced learning agent uh, in one of these two sides. As you can see, there's a learning phase and there's a learned phase. Uh, during the learning phase, the agent is trying to know what is a good uh, uh, operation strategy. During that time, you can see uh, our total uh, energy consumption uh, uh, changed along with the time. But one, along with the time, uh, the agent can gradually figure out what is the optimal uh, uh, operation strategy, as you can see here in the learned uh, phase. So the overall consumption uh, can, uh, can be uh, throttled into a certain level. So we successfully control the total of the peak load uh, in, in such a scenario, okay? That's uh, our um, preliminary result. So here's a conclusion. Uh, uh, so, so in this project, uh, we try to uh, investigate uh, electricity load management with collaboration uh, between smart buildings and the e-buses. And we propose a deep reinforced learning approach. Uh, um, and uh, we, we, we have some preliminary results to show that uh, this uh, uh, smart agent can dynamically adjust our, uh, uh, our uh, charging station or buildings uh, energy usage uh, strategy so that the lower the overall the peak uh, energy consumption of our campus can be throttled okay so that's a uh, and then in the future we are trying to uh, we, are tra we are currently we are seeing uh, collaborations and uh, also we are trying to make our uh, pro approach more realistic we want to consider more uh, 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 more practical settings in this uh, to make it more practical to consider more uh, uh, real constraints something like that okay so that's it uh, so uh, that's that's my presentation if you have any question just ask me a question thank you thank you thank you dr wang um so i i have a question um with regard to, are there security and privacy implications to um, the work that you're doing? Uh, yeah, so definitely. Have... Yes, that's a very good question. Yeah, definitely. I would say this is there's a secure, uh, security concern. There's a, uh, but uh, I'm not a, <laughs> uh, the secure, uh, security and the privacy expert. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we, that security is it's a very important thing. Uh, definitely, we want to integrate that part into our design. Uh, uh, so we, we, so here's our plan. We try to start with, uh, uh, we, uh, with uh, our our campus to see if there's any security concerns. And if there's any secure concern, we we, we may try to uh, find a, a expert which is uh, which is a, which is in cybersecurity to help us to address this uh, issue. 
Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Mm -hmm. Very important work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite Michael Bell, who is assistant professor in the management department of a New Jersey City University. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, just one second. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, first, it's uh, kind of funny. I'm using this um, computer light for the first time, and it's kind of blinding me, which I don't think it's what it's supposed to do. So we'll just try to um, uh, anchor through. So. I'm going to take a little uh, different tack now. We're um, not going to talk so much about the technology a little bit, but we're going to talk about some legal aspects of smart cities and specifically with, with respect to smart, sustainable cities. Um, Michael, excuse me. Could you put this in presentation mode? Yes. Thanks. There. Perfect. Thank oh, you. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first, I, I, I want to thank the New Jersey Big Data Alliance for um, inviting me um, to this presentation. I am uh, very excited about presenting this work. It's an emerging interdisciplinary area, and I am really looking forward to your questions and your um, suggestions. Um, again, we're going to uh, take a little different take and talk about uh, some of the legal aspects that um, really have not been discussed so much at all in, in the literature, along with smart, sustainable cities, cities, which is not a subject that has been given a, a, a lot of publication, but it is a burgeoning area. Um, so first, I, 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 I'm going to uh, define to you uh, later what a smart, sustainable city is, but I want to talk about this word inclusivity. So. Um, the, the, the title of the presentation, The Role of Inclusivity in the Evolution of Law and Policy to Accommodate Smart, Sustainable Cities. And we're going to talk about law, but we're going to link it to urban planning and link it to smart, sustainable city agenda. Okay, um, so this word inclusivity has a kind of uh, common common meaning uh, in terms of being more fair and equitable and, and, and particularly with respect to underrepresented communities. And that is a part of what we're going to, going to discuss with respect to sustainable development. However, um, inclusivity has a different shade of meaning, slightly different shade that we that I want to sort of get into the lexicon of the smart, sustainable um, agenda. Um, in, in this work, I want to show how inclusivity, in addition to meaning uh, fairness and equi equity, also actually gives legitimacy and meaning to, to law and policy that we want to develop with respect to this fast-paced um, innovation that's occurring uh, in, with, with, with smart cities. Um, inclusivity, so, so to do this, we're going to, we need to link inclusivity and urban planning and development with smart cities. So to some extent, um, what, we're, what I'm advocating is that for those that are in the smart city, sustainable, the smart, sustainable city agenda, that they somewhat link themselves to the precepts that of, of urban planning and the, 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 the practices that probably are not gonna change as a result of all of the uh, technology. Um, Inclusivity as used in this work actually picks up on much of what we term American pragmatist philosophy. We're, and, and, and we're not gonna go into that so much, but it's important to, to bring up that term because that has been sort of a foundation of urban planning and development throughout the years. And what it, what it really does, it, it discusses particip participatory governance experimentation, reflection, and also pays attention to sort of the different power structures in plural societies such as ours. Um, 
So, so let's sort of kind of define uh, what a smart, sustainable city is. So it's a relatively new concept. You know, we, we have a lot of um, literature on smart cities and some literature on sustainable cities, but there's been recent efforts to try to integrate these two aspects. And of course, the law and policy continues to, to lag behind. Um, uh, so one of the ways much has been written, much has been written about uh, smart cities and sustainable cities, but the reason we're moving now to try to integrate these two uh, concepts is because of increasing urbanization, which we're gonna talk about soon. So one of the ways to integrate these two, two concepts, it's been thought is to you know, take the goals of sustainability and match them with smart city tools, meaning using smart city tools to advance the goals of environmental, environmental concerns, uh, socio-ecological concerns, which also involves a lot of fairness and equity principles, which go into uh, this whole idea of sustainability of cities. Um, um, so there are many definitions of smart city and there's no one one uh, definition that the, the that academics or practitioners have actually settled on, but um, what is generally accepted is that a smart city is characterized by widespread use of a combination of various forms of information and communications technology, which we're going to, going to refer to uh, going forward as ICT. And this includes much of what's been discussed yesterday and today, ubiquitous computing, the internet of things, Cynthia computing, that kind of thing. And all of that technology is of course merged or integrated with traditional urban infrastructure, people, places, uh, things. Um, what is a sustainable city? Again, there's no one definition that, that's been settled upon, but we're, um, we're sort of forming it now. In, in the last three or four years, that, that definition has started to settle a bit. And what, we, what it actually focuses on is emphasis on environmental concerns and socioeconomic needs. Um, what is the appropriate balance between environmental concerns and socioeconomic needs? I mean, the, the long-term goal of a sustainable city is to have a balance. Well, we don't know what the balance is, but the balance is going to be determined in the context of that particular community, that particular jurisdiction. And that is where we sort of need to focus on the, the stakeholders that are engaged in, in in that community to figure out what balance is appropriate for them. Um, so increasing urbanization and the need to focus on smart, sustainable cities. Um, this is the reason why the whole agenda of smart, sustainable cities has sprung up. Uh, it's been estimated that by the year 2050, 66% of the world's population will live in cities. Um, so the smart, the smart sustainable city concept has emerged as a response to uh, the potential for greater environmental uh, crises and escalating social inequalities and injustices. If we just think about now our, our present period and, and, and these issues, imagine that being exacerbated many times fold as, as the world population concentrates uh, uh, more densely and, and packs more densely within cities. Um, so I, I want to get back to sort of this um, strategy and, and, and how are we going to sort of get to law uh, and how, how are we going to evolve law to help government in its, in its decision making with respect to smart tools and with respect to meeting the goals of long-term sustainability. Um, we we want to think of the smart sustainable city as an urban development strategy. So again, um, where I, I mentioned that uh, data programmers and data scientists that are involved in the smart sustainable city agenda to, to some extent should uh, view themselves as urban planners or at least look to see what those foundational precepts are so that they can make, make a contribution uh, to the goals. Um, 
if we view the smart sustainable city as an urban development strategy, we can also view the city, think of the city as a system, as a socio-ecological system. And what we wanna do is to take purposive action to keep the natural and social systems in balance. How do we do that? Um, increasing urbanization and, uh, and societal pressures. So if we wanna think about um, how the city system could become imbalanced, you can undermine the natural and social systems can occur through increased pollution, environmental degradation, health decrease, social instability, social injustice and, and inequality. And also something that hasn't been given um, much attention um, in the literature, but the, the ongoing march to increasing the amount of ICT in urban community uh, throughout the, the, the different localities, that has a cost. That, that has a cost in terms of consumption of energy. So we have to, if we're not only concerned about the, the, the smart city itself and that technology, but we also are concerned about the smart sustainable city, we have to be cognizant that, hey, do we really need this particular uh, new technology? Do we really need this um, uh, um, public action? With, public action uh, taken if we're trying to look, if we're trying to keep things more, more of in a balance. Um, so when we're, when we're talking about sustainability and socio-ecological systems, um, we're having a debate about how we want to live, right? We're, we're having a debate, a, a, a debate about how things ought to be and how we, and, what's the, what, how do we choose to live? And, and, and it's a normative question. It's a moral question. And, and, and when you're answering a, a normative question or a moral question, that sort of invites a complex dialogue in which the uh, average citizen has to take place, uh, has to take a part in. Um, moral questions, normative questions, aren't questions that government necessarily can decide without consultation and debate with citizens. Those are questions that um, private industry can't decide without consultation with, uh, it, consultation with government who is accountable to its citizens. So I, I, I wanna sort of put a conditioning uh, element on, on the smart, smart city agenda. So in referencing Classic planning theory. One of the one of the tools is is one of the the precepts is that we don't want public action. Well, public action is not favored when it is when it is allowed to run amok. Meaning, it should be justified by the identification um, and recognition of public norms which condition public action. And let's parse that a little bit. Um, a public action should be motivated by the desire or need to solve a problem, right? And how are you going to solve that problem? Well, that problem could have many different approaches to its resolution, but you're going to refer to public norms. What do the citizens think about privacy in the new era of technology? What do they think about these environmental issues? And it's through the solicitation of that dialogue that we can begin to frame sort of broad normative principles on which to build law and policy. Um, so the, similarly, with the ubiquitous use of new ICT and urban computing innovations, maybe something to think about is think of that as a public action. Uh, the, the widespread of the uh, widespread use of sensors. Think of that as a public action. And maybe that action should or could be based on its contribution to environmental and socioeconomic needs and concerns as perceived by citizens. Um, picking up on what uh, the speaker, the keynote speaker uh, alluded to this, this morning, uh, she mentioned that, you know, um, perhaps not all of the uses of big data 
that are occurring now are uses of big data that we necessarily need it, it to be used for. Maybe we need it to be directed uh, and conditioned based on what the problems are in society. Um, so, er, so uh, yeah, uh, urban planning and law have a long relationship, right? And there's been kind of tumultuous that relationship because urban planning is thought to be emergent, just like the smart city technology is thought to be emergent. But law has a sort of static feature to it. It's, it's not flexible enough in terms of planning. So there's been a big tension there. But what is um, exacerbated now is that as we march towards increasing urbanization, we've got to find a way to build in more resiliency, to formulate policy, to formulate law for, uh, for the smart, sustainable city so that we can monitor what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and what's justified. Um, so when I talk about resilient law and, con and contextual contextualization, what we're really talking about is, you know, what does privacy mean to this particular community in respect of uh, the norms that they think are important? Who are involved in, in, in those norms? What are their relative positions? Um, law, all of law is based on justification and the idea of norms competing and arriving at a compromise, not a consensus, but a compromise. And in order for law to have legitimacy, it has to be, has, has to have some sort of societal embedding. And that is kind of what we're talking about. So if, if we think about it in, in terms of privacy, um, there could be no privacy or there could be complete privacy. But the way to mediate that is through law and policy, which helps set some guardrails for that. Um, the Supreme Court uh, has recognized that the, this whole notion of privacy has changed, but they've also recognized that we have not given up completely on this idea of privacy. So there, are, there is room, they've made room and allowances for the fact that there has to be some semblance of privacy, but we're not gonna get that from private companies. We're not gonna get that from government. We're gonna kind of have to get that from the citizenry that's involved in these aspects of computing. If you think about um, environmental issues, um, one of the ways we can develop law and policy with respect to environmental issues is just, just to think about some broad principles, environmental justice land principles. So let, let's just think about a concept like fair, fair and healthy land use. Have a debate, have uh, ICT and computing uh, methodologies that help us organize better and organize that debate to figure out for the, for communities, what does fair and healthy uh, land use mean? And then we can build upon that policy and law that makes sense for various communities. Still um, continuing with the environmental aspect, there are other principles um, such as um, non-shift principle. Uh, that means that to what extent does what I do in this part of the community affect that community? And how am I gonna consider that in terms of the law and policy that I want to uh, create? Um, the, degree of, the degree of prescription, a law that's too detailed that uh, allows for only one way to comply with a, a uh, to comply with an environmental rule um, is not, doesn't allow for enough flexibility. How, how are we gonna know what's the appropriate justified uh, point of flexibility? Um, so I, I want to, um, there's a, there, there is one problem and we, we've discussed it. Many jurisdictions don't have the wherewithal to um, create, use this data to create algorithms themselves. And so we have an issue possibly of policy outsourcing. The algorithm itself does have a politics. And so when we're um, having outside vendors or contracting with them to create uh, these algorithms for us, do those algorithms give us enough to say that, hey, we can create law and policy based on what is presented 
but that there has been a disconnect there. There hasn't been a connection with the community to sort of develop that. And I and I, I think one of the speak the, the keynote speaker uh, spoke upon that um, earlier today. Um, I have one one final uh, quote, and it's um, from the late Louis D. Brandeis, and it just talks about our federal system and how can we make this work. Well, we can experiment. Um, uh, and what Louis D. Brandeis said many years ago is, it is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. So um, one final concept I, I want to sort of leave you with is that when we, when we actually determine that um, when we contract with an outside vendor um, to address a socioeconomic need or problem, um, and the, 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 the package is delivered, we should view that as a working hypothesis. Does it contribute to furthering the goals of sustainability or does it not? We should test it out. If it does not, we should perhaps come back and, um, and try again. Um, and I think that concludes my presentation today. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, I have just one question. Um, you provided some very interesting um, insights into um, many con concepts that are interconnected. Um, the intersection of inclusivity, law and policy, urban policy, and integrating smart cities and sustainable cities principles requires interdisciplinary work. Um, could you provide an example of, um, of what this type of a team would look like? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, that type of a team, um, and even based on the literature, would include data programmers and data specialists. It would include government officials and academia, uh, much like the um, makeup of, of the New Jersey Business Study Alliance, but it would also include, as uh, I think our previous panel indicated, it would include um, leaders from the local community to sort of frame what is it that we want to contract out for this company to do for us? And does it make sense? Um, data programmers are mostly interested in being accurate based on what they have to do. But the, the community itself might have a whole different issue in terms of environmental or economic. And perhaps we should look to see what their concerns are so that we can develop a policy and law that's appropriate for them. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, I'd like to introduce Deep Patel who is a PhD student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rowan University. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, can, can, can you see my screen or not yet? No, not we yet. see your desktop, Deep. And now we see your share. Right? Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yep. So hello, everyone. First of all, good afternoon. And yeah, I'll try to today uh, provide about one of our research items that is for the evaluating the intersection safety using surrogate safety measures and non-compliance behavior. So basically, this is something about like intersections uh, that intersections on the roadway. So that's a day to day, -to -day life uh, safety parameters that everybody who drives on the road has uh, thinks about it, keeps on it, but how they are evaluated, how they have to be looked at, or how can we collect such kind of data in a huge quantity to see the future benefits out of it. So yeah, that was our main part of this whole project. Yeah, this was uh, the, our research team is Dr. Mohammed Jalai, who is the PI of this project. And uh, we have Dr. Nidal and Dr. Rasul from the EC department of our university who were the co-PIs and we, uh, like me and uh, Abdul, uh, Abdul, uh, Abdul Qadir, uh, we both were the students who have worked on this project uh, in the past and then I'm continuing with the phase two of this project right now. So, yep. And today in the this presentation, I'll go over to the introduction section, data collection methodology that we implemented and the video analysis that we did to extract out some data from those videos and then the safety analysis parameters that we have implemented and some results from the preliminary testing part that we did and the drawn conclusion from that. 
Uh, yeah, so looking forward to this thing. So according to the federal FHWA, basically that's the highway administration, there are more than like 50% of the combined fatal and injury crash occur at or near to the intersection every, like it's basically every year it comes to be a 50%. And additionally, there are millions of minor crashes, right? So our conflicts basically that are not reported because there are some standard rules that have been followed that if the damage is about like $500, then only it's reported into the database and then other stuff is not reported as, a, as to the database that right now is available. So towards identifying such conflicts and near miss events, uh, we try to use a proactive approach. That's a surrogate safety measures, which have been right now uh, presently been uh, widely been implemented in the recent years at several different states and different agencies to see how crashes are correlated with the conflict events or the near miss events that were like, was a part, it may have, may would have resulted into a crash, but it's not. So they do that such kind of analysis towards which we listed out the potential uh, data requirements for the safety analysis that we want to conduct. So we looked over to the crash data, then the conflict points of those intersections. Uh, then we look over to the speed, speed of those vehicles who, who we see in the videos, then the traffic volume, road users, and the signal indicators that is like red, yellow, green, what kind of signals are being done. And we used uh, several different cameras. So one of them is over here that I put down is the count camp to cameras, which helped the DAOs to do data collection for around like 70, 80 hours continuously. But we have a simultaneous different approaches also we put forward is like using the 511 cameras and other present available sources from the DOT or the agency sites that we have. Uh, in terms of the video analysis framework, uh, for us in this project, we use YOLO as one of the main frame detection algorithm and then further uh, introduce our own algorithm for doing the tra uh, tracking and uh, doing uh, and creating the trajectories out of all those data. So trajectories basically the each point like in each frame where the vehicle stands. So like at each and every point, we try to see that what's the movement of the vehicle is seen. And as YOLO is very quick and fast, so it can even help us out to do some kind of real time data analysis. So we can do this thing in real time and get some values side by side. Uh, so yeah, so the, the major focus for this work was like the safety analysis. So for the safety analysis, we did some traffic counting so wherein we try to classify the road user into different categories like road, uh, truck vehicles, uh, small trucks, SUVs, or the compact cars, what kind of vehicles there are, then total number of vehicles entering the intersection were being counted. So that leads to, to the traffic volume, even looked over to the total number of pedestrians using the crosswalk and uh, going from one, uh, one of the, one of the crosswalk, uh, one of the sides of the road to the other side. And also we looked over to this counts bit on the directional flow. So very dedicatedly, we try to see that which vehicle, uh, which vehicle or a pedestrian who goes from northbound to the southbound or westbound, where they start and where they end up basically. And looking over to the safety parameters, uh, second part was over violation and non-compliance event. So technically, those are the two words that we use as a non-compliance event. Uh, so to be into the layman side, it's the count of the vehicle who are doing the red light running violation. So they during the red light, they try to run or they come near to the intersection and then they avoid the parameters that they do. And the second was the uh, counts of the pedestrians jaywalking event. So basically that's the crossing, uh, pedestrian crossing the roads uh, in respect to the signal or even the second thing is like they're not using the cross. So both the parameters were being compared and see, seen. So this was our uh, like initial, if you look over to the side on the pictures on the top and the bottom one. So this were the initial uh, input parameters that we used to define the red light bars and then tra track down all the stuff and make some algorithm uh, conditions based on these parameters. Uh, and the safety, param uh, the, the third part is the surrogate safety analysis. That is an approach that is a proactive approach that we use before any crash happened. What could be a possibility of a crash if the conditions were not fulfilled in a proper way or the maneuvering would have been modified, right? So we try to do one of the parameters is the post encroachment time. And we also took out the travel paths of the road user to see what's the flow look like so over the whole intersection of the 
test bed intersection that we used, right? So for the surrogate safety measures, uh, so I'll start with this thing. So what is, I'll give you just a briefing on this post encroachment time. So it makes you more interactive to this PowerPoint more, right? It is a time, uh, is a time between the leaving of an encroaching vehicle from the conflict point. So like if you assume in a space and time diagram, this is a conflict point, right? And we look over to this thing. So vehicle from the conflict point and the entering of the vehicle with an approaching way at the conflict point. So if you look over to this one, so uh, when a vehicle that is passing through at a standard speed and not make any modification is by passing through, right? And when the second vehicle, the through or the, the ve vehicle or a pedestrian who is at the same point, right? Uh, reaches that same point and the time difference between them. So basically the time that, uh, let's assume this intersecting vehicle reached over here. So that is the time when it reached that conflict point and the other vehicle that reaches that same point after a certain time, right? Technically, because if they reach at the same time, it would be a crash. So there are certain parameters in based on the reaction time of a person, driving activity, walking speed and everything, right? So there are some certain defined thresholds that have been defined by uh, based on several categories in the FHWA. So for this purpose of the activity, uh, we use the 1.5 to 5 second threshold, uh, which means that when it is, uh, when there is a there is not enough space of five seconds, and this is in respect to the uh, speed also. Like depends on the speed of the intersection. Like if it has a high speed, then the thresholds might differ. If it is a low speed, so it it, it totally depends on the geometry and the concepts that we have been implemented at the intersection. So and then the second vehicle that comes to that point. So the difference between those two points is considered as the period. That's a post encroachment time period, right? So if that time period goes less than 1.5 or it's 1.5, it is a very dangerous conflict. So there is a high chance or possibility of ending up into a crash due to such kind of maneuvering. But if it is more, th uh, more than five, or it is like five or more than five, it can be considered as a conflict, but there can be possibilities of less chances of getting into the crash. So for this purpose, we collected the videos from the um, one of the Morris counties in the top north regions, uh, Speedwell well Avenue and Eastern Street in the Morris town. And uh, this was the kind of setup that we did in the earlier sessions to get some data out of this and experiment on the algorithms that have been developed, developed during this research part, right? So there was a camera that we set up which focused onto this following region. Yeah, so so going over to the results of this whole part, uh, we, we collected a 35 minutes of video with a high resolution camera that was uh, placed on the top of the building uh, and the frame we kept as to be 30 FPS. And then we took out some results and tried to check its accuracy. And we ended up coming up to an accuracy for like, if you look over to the detail aspect, you can see each and every accuracy period for each and every bound. Let the vehicle started from northbound, southbound, east and westbound. Uh, but overall, if you combine all the data and everything, we came up with a 96, nearly to 96% accuracy for that uh, that video length. And seems like our algorithm fits best for such kind of analysis, because usually in such kind of uh, detection and tracking part, all the accuracies vary from 85 to 98, 99%, somewhere near by that thing. Uh, so yeah, so if you look, uh, how, so the tool that we have, uh, we, uh, the I would say not the tool, but the, the developed uh, research right now ongoing part can also give us something like an OD matrix. So what is OD matrix? What's the start point and the destination point of that vehicle? So we can try to see like from north, uh, there were like around uh, 300. Uh, let's say that the, the vehicle that started from north was a uh, certain amount and ended up in south, right? So there were 329 vehicles who started from north and ended up in south. So we can get that whole metric system and then try to do several evaluation to see uh, what is the commercial buildings, if there are commercial buildings nearby, what is the traffic flow to those locations, how many pedestrian flow locations are also correlated with that part or not. So that is a very good uh, detailed investigation can be brought out using such kind of data of uh, from such uh, analysis basically. And in terms of the non-compliance, so that was the second thing that we were majorly looking at. And we wanted to see that uh, how many vehicles are violating the bar. So like, if you can see over here, uh, we, we did a detailed investigation, like we get every 10 minutes, we take out the data and it's an automated process. I'll show you further how the video looks like and the, how the tool demonstrate this thing. 
but every 10 minutes right now at this initial phase we can con uh, narrow down this to every one minute also or even three minutes to come up to the most nearest real-time data visualization uh, so you can see over here like this was the vehicle which entered this uh, intersection bar and this was this came into the violation side right because the bar that we created was this thing and if you see this is the green signal so technically the this bound and this bound they both only have the permission to get or enter the intersection but this vehicle cannot enter the intersection right now so but it entered it so it is a technically a violation that the vehicle has done right so and then in terms of the pedestrian part so if you look over to this part so this person is not using a crosswalk and trying to cross the intersection right so but if you look over to this one and this one they are properly walking on the crosswalk or the shoulders so they are into the proper side but this is the violation that the pedestrian has done and this might can end up leading into a crash or even into a fatal injury to this pedestrian right because it's a maneuvering without like any making concern of the crosswalk or anything uh yeah so and in terms of the safety parameters uh, as i was talking about like the difference or the time so there were around 67 dangerous conflict events in that 35 minutes of a time uh, video period and it's very very dangerous thing so to see like 67 events so that could be like ending up into like an event is a basically a pair of two vehicles or vehicle or pedestrian it can be anything but it's a pair basically so it can end up into a very very critical situation so there can be some ideas can be driven to provide some uh, good uh, good recommendation or educational sense can be brought out based on this kind of results coming up from the data yeah so this is like our tool looks like so it keeps going on to the video and then in the side of that part you would be able to see what's going on if there is any violation that has happened or something like that we get keep getting the data at the real time at a, uh, at a difference of five minutes ten minutes whichever threshold we come up so that is like a modifiable parameter but we can get such kind of data from uh, the video analysis tool that we have developed right now and overall conclusion from the whole research that we draw is the develop uh, the deployed AI algorithm uh, demonstrated around 96% of the detection and tracking accuracy and uh, safety analysis parallel can help in investigating the relationship between the human uh, driving uh, behavior and collision risk at an intersection. And overall, the developed tool would help the state department transportation and local agencies evaluate intersection safety and extract visual extract and visualize uh, real time traffic data basically so it would be a huge data if we implemented onto the cameras that right now are installed at the intersections to visualize and do the records of the intersection right. Uh, towards which I would like to acknowledge our sponsors that the study was uh, sponsored uh, supported by the server uh, awards from the Rutgers University and the Department of Transportation so from the Office of uh, Assistant Secretary so that's the FHWSI basically. and thank you everyone. Thank you very interesting work I was wondering if um, the results of this type of research is helpful to um, manufacturers of of uh, vehicles especially uh electric vehicles yeah so yeah that's a very good point you brought up into this thing so so when you end up into the C cavs like connected and automatic uh, automatic vehicles so the data that we get we stored can be directly integrated to the tra uh, traffic signals and those traffic signals data would be connected with the automated vehicles or the EV vehicles that have been recent technologies which get connected to the traffic signal movement, right? So those would be an advanced process where we can use this data or such kind of data for safety parameters of pedestrians or everybody. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. And um, I want to thank you and all the other uh, presenters for um, uh, sharing your great research and um, uh, the uh, all the attendees, thank you for um, staying with us. This brings us to the end of the symposium, and um, we look forward to seeing you all next year. Um, we um, also invite you to participate in the survey so that we can um, get your feedback and um, 
and um, incorporate it into our future symposiums. Thank you so much and um, have a great day. Thank you.